Hello and welcome to our conversation today. I'm Larry Jacobs, I'm professor and director of the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. I wanna start by expressing sadness about the passing of Walter Mondale. We had taught together and moderated many programs together. He was a friend and a mentor for much of the past 16 years and he will be missed. Um, okay, to our program today, I'm gonna let you know that um, we, we value your participation. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. Click that, we're gonna to get to as many questions as we possibly can. Um, I wanna welcome and thank you for joining us for today's program, The Next Era of Capitalism with Hubert Jolie and Rebecca Henderson. To introduce today's panel is Andrea Wood, who's Vice President of Social Impact from Best Buy. Andrea? Thanks so much, Larry. Welcome everyone and really appreciate you joining us today. I'm Andrea Wood. I'm the Vice President of Social Impact for Best Buy and I'm also a proud Humphrey School alum and member of the Humphrey Advisory Council. So today I have the pleasure of introducing our esteemed guests, Rebecca Henderson and Yuber Jolie. Rebecca is a professor at Harvard Business School, a research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a fellow of both the British Academy and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her research explores the degree to which the private sector can play a major role in building a more sustainable economy. She recently published the book, Reimagining Capitalism in a World of Fire, which explores the future of capitalism. And Yuber Jolie is a senior lecturer at the Harvard Business School and the former chairman and CEO of Best Buy. He's been recognized as one of the top 100 CEOs in the world by the Harvard Business Review and one of the top 30 CEOs in the world by Barron's. He's also the author of the upcoming book, The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. In this book, Hubert unveils his personal philosophy for achieving extraordinary outcomes for all stakeholders by putting purpose and people first. And as we face an array of issues from political polarization and the need for racial justice, as we saw just in, in Minneapolis yesterday, uh, to the pandemic and climate change, the heart of business is an urgent call for the refoundation of business and capitalism, and also the playbook for how to do it. You know, I was lucky enough to be at Best Buy when Hubert took over as CEO, and I can tell you from personal experience that his ability to put purpose and people first was key to his success in turning around the company. And even in the most difficult of times for Best Buy, you have never wavered from this philosophy. Just one example of that is he, he doubled down on Best Buy's commitment to positively impacting our communities. And as CEO, he, he oversaw the growth of Best Buy Teen Tech Centers, which are free after-school tech programs for youth. We have those all over the country now. These programs help youth explore their passions and prepare for college and careers. In fact, Hubert has announced he's donating the proceeds of his book, The Heart of Business, to our teen tech centers. We're very excited about that. The book will be out May 4th. I urge all of you to read this incredibly timely and important book. Uh, and for more information to or, or to order a copy, you can visit hubertjolie.org. So without further ado, please welcome Rebecca and Hubert. Thank you. Andrea, thank you very much for that very friendly introduction. And Hubert, thank you very much for joining me in this conversation. Uh, let me begin by saying that I loved your book. Um, oh, it's funny, it's interesting, it's, uh, it's well written, and I read a lot of business books. So, uh, <laughs> and so you've written I, an amazing one, which I had the pleasure of endorsing two years yeah. ago. So I think that uh, we can probably do, in retail, we could do a two, four, right? <laughs> you're, you're very kind. Um, Hubert, it's a pleasure to be having this conversation with you. As, as I reflected on the verdict yesterday and on the reaction to that verdict across the country and I think even around the world, mm -hmm. I was struck by the way that business leaders were speaking up and saying that they were excited about the verdict, that it was very much a milestone, but that it wasn't the end of the journey. And I think for me, it was emblematic of the way in which business leaders are being challenged to lead in very different kinds of ways. 
And so a conversation on really reimagining capitalism, rethinking the purpose of business, um, I think could not be more timely. So, uh, so let me ask the obvious question. <laughs> Best Buy was on its last legs when you became the CEO. Um, most people thought it was going to die. Yeah. What did you do? What were the critical elements that enabled you to turn it around? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Rebecca, it's a delight to have this conversation with you. I, I think the world of you. Uh, yes, you're right. 2012, if we rewind and we remember this in Minneapolis, I think it's fair to say everybody thought we were going to die. There was zero buy recommendation on the stock. So that's one of the ways you, you, you know. So what did we do? What did I and the 125,000 people at Best Buy do? I mean, we, there were several phases. There was a first phase, which we called Renew Blue, which was about, and I'll first describe the what and then the how, but uh, the what was fixing what was broken. So pretty basic. It was uh, making sure our prices were competitive, taking price off the table, investing in the online shopping experience, making sure that we would ship very quickly as fast as Amazon. So essentially we neutralized Amazon through these three actions. And then of course we invested in our stores and our store associates. We did these partnerships. So we refused, I refused zero sum games, right? It's, these are artificial. So we, we partnered with the world's foremost tech companies to enable them to showcase the fruit of their billions of dollars of R&D investment, which was good for the customers, good for them and good for, for us. And we essentially did not do, you know, the, the biggest advice I was getting at the time, Rebecca, was cut, cut, cut. Now you're gonna have to close stores. You're gonna have to cut headcounts. My view in a turnaround, you know, you, you cut headcount as a last resort. First focus is grow the revenue. And if you're gonna go after cost, you first go after what I call non-salary expenses, which is the bulk of the cost structure. As an example, you know, it, we, we sell a lot of TVs at Best Buy. They're thin, they're big, so they break. $200 million of TVs, we would break every day. If you can cut this in half, you know, that's a good thing. So it's a, it's a people first. So the philosophy in this first phase, even though things were really grim, it's a people first approach. I spent my first week working in stores in St. Cloud, Minnesota. I think they should say St. Cloud, but you know, they, they'll still say St. Cloud. Uh, you know, working in the store, listening to the frontliners, they knew everything that we had to do. It was people first by rebuilding the team at the top, making sure we had the right team. And it was people first by creating energy. I think sometimes as leaders, we get confused. We think it's all about figuring out the right answer. It's not that hard. I think our role as leaders is to create energy. In physics, we're taught that energy is a finite resource, right? We know this from an environmental standpoint. As you and I know from an organizational standpoint, it's not a finite business. And our role as leaders is to create that energy and enable the organization to, to perform. That was the first phase. The second phase, when we had, once we had Safe Best Buy, was around adopting a noble purpose. We said, we're not a consumer electronics retailer. We're a company that's there to enrich lives through technology by addressing key human needs, which vastly enlarge our addressable market and help mobilize the entire organization. But importantly, it was about creating an environment and that was a key focus that enabled, maybe we'll talk about this on the how, but to do what I call unleash human magic. And so there's a philosophy behind this, this turnaround and resurgence. And it's this philosophy that I share in the book, which I think is the foundation for this next era. Business is about pursuing a noble purpose putting people at the center as a source, not a problem, embracing all stakeholders and trying to serve all of them at the same time in support of that purpose, creating the environment where everybody can blossom and treating profit as an outcome, not the goal. And in the book, there's many, many anecdotes around this. And what I talk about is, you know, sounds soft. It's really hard to do. It sounds like something that now most leaders agree with. Uh, and I think most of us are on this journey of how do you change? Because you know we can agree that the world is facing this multifaceted crisis, right? What would be the definition of madness? Do the same thing we've been doing for the last 40 years and hope for a better outcome. Eh, it's not gonna work. We have to step back, reset, 
and adopt these new principles so that we can move things forward. And I think the, the delightfully surprising Best Buy story and journey, um, you know, make, gives it credibility, right? Because our share price went from $11 to I think around 120 now. Uh, and it, it, but it's much bigger than Best Buy. It's these principles of purposeful leadership that uh, I'm so excited about and that we'll talk about. So um, Hubert, can we go just a tiny bit deeper on both on, on yes. a, the couple of the principles you mentioned? Um, and I agree with you. I think many CEOs would be comfortable to have something like those principles on the wall in the office. Yeah. But what's unusual about Best Buy, not totally unusual, there are other firms that are on this wavelength that are making huge progress, but, but what was so dramatic about Best Buy was you really put it into practice. And, and let's just take for a moment the strategic reorientation. The idea that the store is not just a kind of another place you could pick up a piece of computer electronics, but that the employees there are your technology consultants, that they're working with you to find the right piece of technology for you. And here's the booth with all the latest Apple technology in it. And, you know, was, was that like obvious? I mean, do you just look at the noble purpose and go, oh, well, yes, this is what we should do. I mean, did you yeah. have big meetings in the firm? Did you look at many different purposes? I mean, how did the noble purpose connect to this really amazing new strategic vision? It was a, a first phase where it was relatively obvious because before I took the job, because a lot of my friends in Minneapolis thought I was either crazy or suicidal when I took the job. I was not, because what was obvious to me is that the world needed Best Buy, right? As customers, we need a place for at least for some of our purchases where we can touch and feel and experience the products and ask questions. And then the vendors need a place where to showcase the, the fruit of their billions of dollars of, of R&D investment. So the problem was not that we didn't have a reason for being, the problem was that we were executing terribly, which was a great opportunity because we could fix that. But we really focused on the purpose thing a few years later, which actually is a lesson in of itself. Now, because everybody talks about purpose, sometimes you shouldn't start with working on the purpose because if, if your operations are broken, you, know, you, you don't get to talk about purpose, you have to fix what's broken. And so we got to purpose around 2016, 2017, we had declared the turnaround over and we said, how are we gonna grow this company in a faster way? What kind of company do we wanna build? And we did some work on market research. So as you know, Rebecca, I am part of the marketing department at Harvard Business School. So we did the work, we did segmentation, targeting, positioning, and that was really important work. But then there was a turning point. Every quarter, you know, we'd get the executive team together to work on our strategy, our plans, you know, most uh, management teams do this. And at one of these events, I asked every one of the executive team members to come with a picture of themselves when they were little, maybe three or four years old, and we had some really fun pictures. And over dinner, I invited everyone to share with each other our life story. And what, what was it that drives us in life What's, our, what's the meaning of our life? How do we want to be remembered? And that was a game changer because we really got, it's a very rare conversation, I think, in the corporate world. Um, really got us to know each other at a more, much more personal human level. And it allowed us to realize that uh, for 80% of us, not everyone, but 80%, you know, our vision of our life was to do something good in the world. This is in the heart of most human beings, right? Uh, and we said, well, we're in charge of Best Buy, so why don't we use Best Buy to do something good in the world? And so we should think about not just the what we're gonna do, but the why. And that helped us be ambitious in crafting our purpose. And how do you find your purpose? I think it's, it's uh, you know, there's some emotional and right brain side, there's some left brain side. I think it's at the intersection, we talk about it in the book, of four things. Uh, what the world needs, and Believe me, the world needs us. What we're good at and what we can execute on, otherwise it's just fluff. What we are passionate about as a team, and of course, how we can make money. So that's the sweet spot where you find your purpose. But again, staying at that statement does nothing. So you have to do the work of making the purpose the cornerstone of the strategy. And there's a set of very specific growth initiatives that we came up with in support of that purpose, like uh, entry into the health space, 
helping aging seniors stay in their home and live in their home independently longer by putting sensors under their bed, under the sofa, the, in the kitchen, in the bathroom, fall detection. And you know, many of us have aging parents. And in particular during the COVID crisis, being able to monitor if everything is okay, is such a valuable service, which incidentally, we don't sell through our stores, we sell this through insurance companies, which means the purpose is a great way to expand your addressable markets. But then it really became meaningful when you had the 125,000 employees at Best Buy who could begin to write themselves into that story because otherwise it's fluff, right? And so that was the work. This is how to do it. It took us time to get to that point, but that was a turning point. So Hubert, tell us more about that. And, and I appreciate this is the heart of the book. Yeah. You have you know, many chapters talking yeah. about how the, the individual employees really came to feel that they were part of their purpose and how their performance and engagement really increased dramatically as a result. Can, can you say more about really how you did that on a kind of nitty gritty basis? Yes. Did you run like purpose workshops? Did you change the incentives? You know, did you personally visit every store? I mean, how do you do that? You had 125,000 employees. How so let's start with what human magic looks like because that's what you're trying to create. So I'm gonna tell you a story. Uh, so of course in 2012, when we were supposed to die, our quality of service in the stores, not so good anymore. I had done some mystery shopping. It was not great. Now, fast forward to 2019. There's a young woman who's coming to one of our stores, Rebecca. And she's coming with a young child, maybe a three, three or four year old boy. For holidays, the child had gotten a dinosaur toy as a gift. Unfortunately, the dinosaur toy is sick. The head is dismantled from the body, not good. So. They're going to the store to, to get a cure for the dinosaur. Now, at most stores, probably at Best Buy years ago, you would have been pointed in the direction of the toy aisle, and with some luck, you would have been able to buy a replacement toy. This is not what happened on that day. There's two Blue Shirt Associates who saw and understood what was going on, took the sick dinosaur, went behind a counter, and started performing a surgical procedure on the dinosaur toy. And if you're watching Good Doctor on Amazon, which is a great series, you know, they walk the, the child and the mother through the steps. And of course, at the last minute, exchanged the, the, the dinosaur and but gave back to the child a cure. That, so you can imagine the joy for the child and the mother. Now, here's a question. Was there a standard operating procedure at Best Buy on how to deal with cured dinosaurs? Or, or even better, a personal memo from me, right? <laughs> Uh, on how to deal with it, or maybe incentives. This is, you know, you're gonna get more bonus if you, you know, cure more dinosaurs. Of course not. It's a case where the associates found it in their heart to create that joy. And they also felt they had the freedom to do that. And when I saw that happening at scale, I said, and, and it was at a time where uh, growth was accelerating. I said, oh my God what have we done, right? And what we've done is unleash human magic. So I want to go back to your question. But first, we need to help all of us visualize what it looks like. And so it's not the old method. Remember Bob McNamara in the 60s who invented scientific management, where you take a bunch of smart people, create a smart plan, communicate it, measure everything, put incentives in place. That doesn't work because motivation is intrinsic. So there's five ingredients that we talk about in the book at a very nitty gritty. And at a high level, I'm gonna talk about them, but trying to make them come to life. The first one is connecting, it's the idea of connecting uh, individual purpose, what drives us in life with the purpose of the, of the company. So you heard my story about the executive team, but there's another story. There's a store general manager, you know, he would ask every one of the hundred associates in his stores, in his store, what is your dream? At Best Buy or outside of Best Buy, what is your dream? Write it down in the break room. Okay, my responsibility as a store GM is to help you achieve your dream. Mm -hmm. That is transformational. The second ingredient is the idea of genuine human connections. And so here's another story. There's a 
young associate in one of our stores, the Richville store actually in Minnesota, uh, just close to our headquarters. He once told me a story that his life changed when a manager recognized him and took an interest in him. And you know that it was transformative. And you know my compatriot, Rene Descartes of the Cartesian philosophy, who said, I think, therefore I am. I think he's wrong. It's I am seen, therefore I am. And if in the company, every one of us can feel that we exist, that we're respected, that we're valued, it changes everything. It gives us the spark to do extraordinary uh, uh, things. And I don't care about the size of the company because it's one individual at a time. And it's creating an environment where you can be vulnerable. So Cami, I'm giving you nitty gritty. You've asked for it. <laughs> Cami Scarlett, uh, head of HR, once shared with everybody at the company how she had struggled for years with depression following the death of her two parents. You know many C-level executives of Fortune 100 companies who share their vulnerability like this? Not enough. And yet, in any human population, 20% of the population suffers from kind of mental illness. And of course, with this COVID crisis, you know, the anxiety level is through the roof. And of course, that leads to the discussion around diversity and inclusion. Because of course, you want everybody, not just the people who look like me, the white guys, to feel that they belong. You want everybody to belong and to change the, the outcome, which of course, you know, we've been very focused on. So it's things of that nature. There's more details in the book. It's the idea of creating autonomy. It's about also, here's another example. As human beings, we like to grow, right? You and I are in education. And so we like people, you know, people like to acquire new skills. They, they want to grow as human beings. Now, in many companies, training is mass training. Everybody goes for the training, you know, the same training. That does not recognize the unique individuality of each individual working at the company. So Chris Schmidt, uh, an amazing leader at our company, he was the district manager for uh, Denver, invented the concept of individualized coaching at scale. Where as a blue shirt, every week, I would meet with my supervisor and it would be tailored coaching based on what I wanted, the skills I wanted to develop. There's another way to think about this as well, by the way, and I'll finish with that. Um, for us as leaders, how we do performance assessment and performance reviews. I'm gonna ask everybody if you remember having a performance review where your boss tells you three things you're doing well and three things you need to work on, right? Raise, I cannot see you, but raise your hands if you, if you had, right? how draining is this, right? It's crazy, it's bad, it doesn't do anything good. Nobody's happy with these kinds of performance reviews. Over time at Best Buy, I completely changed how I would do performance reviews. In fact, I stopped doing performance reviews. My direct reports would come and see me probably once, you know, uh, uh, every six months. Every one of them had a coach, they would do 360s. And they would come and say, these are the things I'm very excited about that have really worked well recently, you know, great accomplishments. These are things where, you know, I think we can do better. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's been some misses or we, we have upside opportunity. Looking ahead, these are things I wanna focus on, get better at, grow as a leader and, you know, help my organization grow. And this is how I'm planning to do this. Uh, I do little uh, talking, maybe two things. I think you're shortchanging yourself. I think you, there's more to talk about the great accomplishments you've had. And then simply a question, how can I be helpful? And so this is a you know, performance review that's done by the individual. So it's coming from inside. And my role as a leader is to help them grow, provide you know, support, as opposed to believing I'm God and I get to tell you where, you, you know, <laughs> that, where you're good at and where you need to improve. It's much better if we decide how we want to grow and then ask for help. It's, it's transformative. So uh, Hubert, thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm struck by the magnitude of the transformation you drove and by the fact that it's entirely consistent with my reading of modern research into employee yeah. engagement. Yeah. And I think we know that there is a different way to run an organization yeah. where people are treated with dignity and respect, they feel engaged with the purpose, and that that doesn't generate incremental performance improvements, that generates order of magnitude improvements. <laughs> 
And you know, we, we know from the data that in every industry, the top 10 highest performing firms are more than twice as productive as the lowest 10 performing firms with the same capital, the same labor, the same, you know, when you control for everything. I mean, I spent 20 years in windowless conference rooms trying to make this result go away. And it, we know it's correlated with practices like in-depth communication, commitment, long-term commitment to employees, um, trust in the way you manage the incentive system. So, you know, I, I think of you as like, whoa, a fabulous example. And, and the question that always comes up for me, of course, is so how do we generalize? And I, I want to switch to, to some questions because we have a number of people um, uh, typing in and, and you should know a lot of people want to talk politics. So let's make some time for that at, uh, at, at, uh, in a little bit. But just before we go there, um, I have a question from Zeke Jackson. And he says, and Zeke, I'm going, I'm going to paraphrase your question. So forgive me if this is more informal than what you had in mind. But he essentially says, Hubert, you were the CEO. You get to change things when you're the CEO. What can people who are not yet CEO do to try and support this kind of change? Do we just have to wait and hope that people like you show up? That, that seems a little... <laughs> a little depressing. So how does what you've learned translate to people who are not in such a, a position of significant power? Yeah, how, yeah how no, of course. And the, the principles that we're talking about, they're not just for CEOs, they're for every leader. And arguably, every one of us is a leader because at least we're certainly the leader of our life. And I have learned so much from observing the amazing leadership that existed uh, and exists uh, still, of course, at the store level, at the level of a warehouse, the level of a supervisor, because in many ways, you know, we we create our own environment, uh, and so we get to decide. And certainly, in this time of crisis, I've seen so many leaders step back, not just CEOs at all levels. How do I want to show up this during this crisis? How do I want to be remembered? A very interesting exercise is again is write down your retirement speech or write down what you'd like people to say during your eulogy, right? And uh, live like that, do your best to live like that. Now, in some cases, if you live in an, if you're working in an organization that completely perpendicular to these principles, if you can, not always, not everybody can, I recognize this, but if you can in this country, there's great mobility. So for the most part, we have a choice of where we can work. If you can just leave, if you cannot change the environment, leave. But at most places, you actually assume you have the latitude that you can uh, create a different environment. Do your best to create that different environment. And then I think it, has, it can have a radiating uh, effect. So you know, part of wisdom is being clear about what you can control in which you cannot control and being clear about the difference between the, the two. And so uh, try to see what are the areas where you can make a difference. And you know, my own purpose is life starts with trying to make a positive difference on people around me. Whether you're a CEO or a supervisor, you know, we tend to work directly with one or two handfuls of people and how we behave vis-a-vis -vis people just around us you know, is in a sense the biggest way that we have to make a, a difference. So I think it's a, in this book, in what I feel today, it's really a calling for all of us, irrespective of our role, right? Whether we are CEO or a frontline supervisor, whether we, are, we sit on the board, whether we're in business education, whether we are a regulator, an investor, let's reflect, right? Again, doing the same thing and hoping for a different outcome, that's not gonna be good. So. What can I do to create this future that does not exist yet, uh, but that needs to be better and more sustainable? It starts with each of us. That's my, that's my view. Um, Hubert, that's really a call to action. And, no. and I can't resist asking you, since you are now a business school professor, as I am, um, do we need to change our educational system? not only at the MBA level, but in other parts of the educational system? And, and if so, how? Yeah, I do believe we need to change the, uh, in fact, three, I think it was three years ago, 
that I, in, I decided to endow personally a chair at my alma mater in France, HEC Paris, on purposeful leadership. Because my view of business education, and I think it's a shared view, right? Historically, we've placed a lot of emphasis on teaching techniques, and techniques are important, but last time I looked, the best leaders, they're not necessarily the best because they're the best at spelling out the four Ps of marketing or the best at calculating a net present value. If there's something else, which I think we could call leadership, that is at least as important. And I believe, I don't know whether you, everybody would agree, but uh, you know, you don't, you're not born a leader. You become a leader and you can work on becoming a leader. And of course, a lot of it is you know, on the job a lot of it can be taught. And my aspiration is to add my energy, and you and I have talked about it, my energy and, and, and my experience with humility on um, trying to you know, evolve uh, uh, education. I think most business school institutions are on that journey. I look to learn from you, Rebecca, and I know I can, can count on your help, but we, we have to change because so, so much of what we've learned last century I feel is either dated wrong or incomplete. And to your point about research, there's so much research that tells us that there's a different way to do it. And then I think in business education, we can practice the case study method is wonderful. There's you know, all sorts of ways we can progress. And it's not just when we are in college or doing our MBA, there's executive, it's a, it's a lifelong journey. I am the living proof that people can change. You know, If you want to change, you can change. So um, let me tiptoe just a, a tiny bit towards the political or to the broader question of, of broader responsibilities. I have three questions about employee compensation. Um, two of them ask, well, did you consider giving profit sharing or ownership to employees? And the third says, well, how, how did it feel when you know people worked so hard and really turned around the firm and maybe most of the returns went to the shareholders? So as we think about taking care of employees, and I, Hubert, my sense is that this set of questions is, is coming from the perception that you know, capitalism has worked really well for people at the top, but not so much for people on the shop floor. So could you talk a little bit about how you think about that and that? Yeah, balance? no, of course, th this is this is a uh, completely uh, correct uh, point. The uh, level of inequality and injustice is, is uh, you know, explain a lot of the tensions we have today. And my compatriot, uh, uh, Thomas Piketty, has written 1,000 pages on that. <laughs> uh, it's not sustainable. Uh, so it, therefore, it has to be addressed. Uh, we did not, uh, I, I thought about it, but we did not put in place, you know, distributing shares to, to employees. Uh, most employees on the front lines or early in their career, the, the, what's more valuable is, is cash, frankly, because you have, frankly, when you're making, you know, you know beginning level compensation, you, you know, you have immediate needs. So what we did and my wonderful successor, Corey, is, 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 is continuing on this journey. We've uh, tried to increase starting wages as quickly as possible. And so I think that during my tenure, it's been about a 50% increase. I think the starting point now is $15. The other thing we did, by the way, is we um, eliminated or we incorporated variable pay for the frontliners into their pay. Because you know, the old way of thinking is we should put incentives in place. People are gonna work harder. Believe me, if you're making 13 or 14 or $15 per hour, you want the certainty because you need to pay rent, you need to pay the food. And so uh, we felt that uh, it was better to incorporate the target bonus uh, in the, the, the fixed compensation um, as opposed to now uh, GMs and, and maybe assistant managers still have variable pay, but the frontliners don't. So I think that was a very good move. We also, we've, we've spent a lot of time investing in benefits uh, of all sorts and, and really creating opportunities you know, for, for, for the employees. Um, so I think that you know, in business, that's the good news about business. In business, we have a choice of you know, what we can do. And you, know, you have to, sometimes you have to pace yourself if when I started in 2012, we had said to everybody, we're gonna 
you know, increase uh, uh, compensation for the employees by 50%, you know, I would have been laughed out of the room because, you know, first you need to save the company. And so sometimes you have to do things gradually so that you can afford them and it's more sustainable. But I think that's a real discussion. The, the, also the, the question of executive compensation, you and I were, were, were talking about this uh, briefly the other day. You know, there's no logic for the, the level. I mean, it, it, I, I know how it gets created, but the, the ratio between executive compensation and employee compensation makes, makes no sense. Now, the, the, the mechanics of how it gets done create that, but I think, you know, there's other ways to address this. Taxes, I think it would be very comfortable. The more taxes I pay, the happier I get. And of course, I think in this country also, and in Minnesota- yeah, that, That's a phrase that's going to go around the world. I can see really? that. <laughs> yeah, because I thought I learned it from my parents. Uh, because if I pay more taxes, that means in general, I've had more income. So, duh. <laughs> Uh, and then I think in this country, of course, we have a tradition of giving back. I know that the vast majority of what I've made in my life is not going to my children. We've agreed on that. It's, it's uh, being given away to, uh, to charity. I'm not a billionaire, so I'm not part of that pledge, but I'm actually going to give more than 50%. And so, but the, the, uh, you know, the system is not working. And so we have to address. But the other thing, we're in Minneapolis, right? When the city is on fire, you cannot open the stores. You cannot run the company. And so uh, it's obvious that as a business, you know, the, your, your mission has changed. It used to be all about shareholder value creation. And the scope was simply run your business. The mission has changed about creating, by doing well, by doing good. And the scope is to embrace all stakeholders. So of course you have to be responsible for the community, to have to be responsible for addressing systemic racism. And, and do not just talk about it, you have to do something. I love, for example, how the, the general counsel of the Coca-Cola company has written to all of the law firms that they use and said, okay, within 18 months, we're gonna change the composition of our, uh, you know, the law firms we, we work with because we want div racial diversity, meaning black diversity uh, in, in amongst the firms. And we're gonna have milestones. And if you guys don't hit the milestones that we've agreed to, We'll reduce your fees by 30% every quarter. I'm paraphrasing. You can actually Google it, it's online. And so firms can use their power to make a difference in this issue of systemic racism. You know, if, if, if your leadership team, your employee base don't represent the customer base you serve, the community you serve, you're going to miss. It's not going to work. So it's a business imperative to deal with that. I feel, Rebecca, that more and more uh, companies and leaders and boards have, have you know, used their brains and their hearts to feel that you know, we've got a chance. I mean, you, you would need not to be pay paying attention to not feel it. And I think that in the corporate world, we know how to get things done, right? Don't we? I mean, that's, you, know, you don't need to go to Harvard Business School to know how to get things done. And so if we're really serious about the fact that this is something that needs to change, we're gonna apply the same methods that we apply in business to recruit, you know, more diverse candidates, uh, retain them, develop them, uh, and use our power to make a, a difference. So I'm actually optimistic that if we stay with it, we we can, uh, we you know, shrink systemic racism uh, and make a difference. We have to do this, otherwise, you know, the outcome is not a good one, frankly. So Hubert, I, I hear you saying that as we think about these broader social yeah. and environmental issues individual firms can make a huge difference within their own operations. Yeah. I love the story of the Coca-Cola letter and I'm going to look it up because you know most of the senior lawyers I know are of a particular gender and a particular ethnicity. So yeah. I, I wanna see that, that letter. Um, and it's an example of corporations really using their power yeah. in I think very productive ways. And I know because I've, I've checked out the Best Buy website that you have made your environmental commitments, that you make commitments to the community. Andrea talked about the teen centers, which is one of the ways you're really trying to also make a difference and really make the whole economy much more inclusive. And I hope selfishly improve your own workforce and, you know, really, um, you know, make, make wealth for all of us, which I, I, I'm so much on the wavelength of. But I'm going to suggest that 
you know, even if every major firm in the country in the world started to act like this, it would make an enormous difference, but it might not get us quite where we need to go. Yeah. And, and so I'd really like to transition to this question of how should business people think about political engagement? I mean, I don't need to tell you, this is such a live issue at the moment. Just two weeks ago, we had 72 black business leaders come out and say, you know, that Georgia voting uh, legislation, that is, that is not okay. And hundreds of firms joined them in signing a letter saying, no, that, you know, this is a tripwire that's been crossed and we really need to preserve the democracy and we really need to make sure that everyone has the chance to vote. And then at the same week, we get the cover of The Economist saying, and an article saying, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, um, I, how do we feel about business and politics? Um, is this a good thing? Um, how do we think about the legitimacy of the democracy if major corporate leaders are speaking out? And, uh, you know, if when the CEO of Coca-Cola calls the LA Times or the New York Times or Fox Network, they pick up the phone. So, you know, CEOs have huge opportunity to at least influence the conversation. So tell me, how should we think about this, both as citizens and as business people? Yeah. What, what's your view? Yeah, so, so let's try to unpack this because I think there's several uh, conversations uh, embedded in this. The first point you're making is that while individual companies can do a great deal, is that gonna be sufficient and what else can be done? So at the end of the book, there's a call for action for all stakeholders. So of course, I think it's always better if we start with ourselves, right? Before telling other people what to do. My mother, I think told me that, you know? uh, but I think uh, uh, investors are evolving how they think about investing. I think we have to thank Larry Fink and you know, Bill McNabb at Vanguard and, and State Street and so forth, they're, they're very clear now. It's, it's not just about short-term profit, it's long-term profit, it's about sustainability and purpose. So investors have a great role to play. Uh, rating agencies and ISS and Glass-Lewis uh, that are the proxy advisors have work to do because of course we say on pay, the focus today is still very much for executive compensation on shareholder value creation. So. Don't we need to align how we evaluate compensation with this broader idea of uh, stakeholder capitalism? Not necessarily easy. There's the whole question about how do we measure? So SASB is working on this. So that's work that's also going on. Uh, I think that we're making progress in this area. The regulators have got to act. One of the follies of this world that you talk so brilliantly in your book is that the PNL of a company does not represent the true economics of the firm because all of the externalities are not included. And so how do we uh, embed this? There can be carbon taxes, there can be a number of ways the regulators have got to come uh, into play. So everybody has got work to do. And I think that I'm encouraged by the fact there's movement. I think we're at the beginning of this era, and, but uh, there's a lot of work to do and it's urgent, right? Because we have a, a few ticking time bombs, frankly, on, on that. On the issue of, uh, which has really exploded, of as a company, as a business leader, what societal issues you get involved in. And uh, first, it's obvious that you're gonna to have to be involved, right? Because if you believe you're responsible uh, as with others for the greater good of the community, that means that it's not just the four walls of your, of your business. And at Best Buy, you know, we spoke up for the dreamers because we had so many of them. Uh, we wanted to protect them, spoke up, uh, you know, at the moment of the travel ban, you know, I wrote to our employees and said, if you're a Muslim employee, you know, I want to make sure that you feel safe at the, at the company. So there's many, uh, we, uh, at Best Buy, we created the space for people to go vote last November, right? Giving them, uh, we're giving paid time off to get uh, vaccinated. So we're really seeing the employees, not just as employees, but uh, as a whole person, as citizens, as, as uh, fathers and daughters. Uh, one of the things that Corey has done is uh, she's partnered with other leaders locally and the governor to address a big issue, which is uh, the issue of broadband access in rural areas and in underserved communities. That's a big issue for us as businesses because if our employees, their children cannot learn from school when, when there's a lockdown, that's a big issue. So it's quite legitimate to go uh, address this. Now, the thing is that 
as business leaders, we cannot get involved in every issue uh, on the planet uh, because we have this other thing we're doing, which is run <laughs> a company. And also not every issue is relevant or we're not necessarily legitimate for every issue. So I think that businesses, and we have done that at Best Buy, need to develop criteria that lead them to decide when to get involved. So let's take an example, the Georgia law. A CEO was calling me and said, should I say something about the Georgia law? I asked the CEO two questions. One, do you have operations in Georgia? He said, no. Two, have you read the bill? He said, no. Oh, okay. So what do you actually want to say? Uh, now, if you're at Bastion, the CEO of Delta, yes, you have operations in, uh, in Georgia. And if you've not read the law, <laughs> I'm sure by now Ed has read the law, uh, you know, shame on you, you need to read the law. And, and then uh, intervene. Why should you intervene in your state or if you're directly impacted by an issue? Because it impacts, you know, your employees and your, and your community. So you cannot be blind to this. Um, so, but the key for me is uh, use criteria. So, you know, is it relevant? Are you legitimate? Is it going to be authentic? You know, in my marketing class last fall, we teach the, uh, the Colin Kaepernick Nike case, where if you remember, you know, Nike had this uh, commercial with Colin Kaepernick and around the, the protest and, and the knee, which was very legitimate for Nike. They have a lot of black uh, athletes and so forth. But then, you know, somebody said, what, show us your internal practices around diversity and inclusion. Right, so if you if it's if it's not congruent, you, you have to be careful, uh, and then you have to be able to follow through, right, with these things. So, no doubt that you know there's many many more issues that as business leaders we get involved in, but we have to be careful uh, about which ones. Because another example about politics, let's imagine that uh, you know there is a law in uh, a part of Poland on how elections get run in that country. As a US-based multinational, what do you do? You know, are you, again, is, how big are your operations there? How relevant is it? Again, by asking these questions, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, because another example, when Mark Benioff, remember the law that uh, Mike Pence, Governor Pence had uh, established in Indiana, that was really gonna hurt the LGBTQ plus uh, community. Mark Benioff was very clear because, you know, as employers, we, we have a diverse community. He called the governor and said, we're moving, we're leaving. That changed the outcome. So again, I think you have, it's like in everything in business, you have to be thoughtful uh, in, in terms of which ones you pursue. And, and then there's the last question, which is the efficacy. If you're going to do something, is it going to make a difference? Just saying we're in favor of democracy, I'm sorry, it doesn't do anything. Uh, it's, it's, you know, what is it going to do that uh, is going to lead to a difference? So these are some of the questions that I think that uh, it's like in anything, before you act, you have to think a little bit. <laughs> well, I, I love how thoughtful you are about this, Hubert. Um, I'm really looking forward to when we're both back on campus and we have a cup of coffee, because I, uh, I believe quite strongly that U.S. corporations should be speaking out in favor of voting rights, uh -huh. that the democracy is fundamental to the health of the entire society. So whether I have operations in Georgia or not, I have a huge interest in living in a healthy democracy in which everyone believes that their vote is, is counted and that the system is fair. And so I would argue, I mean, it might be a collective interest, but that the private sector has a very strong interest in a, in a strong democracy. And, and I would add to that, and you don't have to reply to this, that I think corporations should also be lobbying to get corporate money out of politics. <laughs> that one of the problems we face is the perception that our political system is soaked in corporate money. Um, you know, $6 billion was spent alone last year influencing politics and that corporations can buy the rules. And, and that kind of leaves a bad taste. And sometimes it's true, maybe sometimes it's not true. And there are all kinds of legitimate reasons for, for business to be involved in, in politics. But in my dreams, I imagine a coalition of business saying, you know, no, you, you've got to pull us back. Uh, we're in a race to the bottom. If my competitor spends, I have to spend. Um, let, let's get the money out. 
Um, yeah, no, I think you're, you're making a, very, a really important point. I, yeah. I've recently become a citizen uh, of this wonderful country, Rebecca. So I, I'm actually very passionate about this. For me, you know, and I've studied uh, in my US constitutional law, I think what, we, what I would love to see is Congress. I, I don't think it should be the states we should dictate the electoral laws and a simple majority can just flip it. I think it's, it's really bad. I think Congress should establish minimum standards and we should have a super majority to, uh, to change the rules. And so for me, the action uh, you know, would be at this level and our common friend you know, and colleague, Michael Porter, you know, we, I think we all believe that the system in this country, the political system is deeply sick. And the question is, you know, what is it going to take to save it? Uh, so it's not whether we should do something, but what is, how do we get to a different outcome? In the great state of Minnesota, I've been supporting the ranked choice voting, uh, you know, reform. That's one of the ways we can do this. Uh, and, and so this conversation shows that, you know, as citizens, forget about business leaders or not, as citizens, you know, the, the state of our country is fragile. And there's a great tradition in Minnesota of, you know, you get in, when I moved there in 2008, you get in the boat and row and you do your best to create a different outcome. And so I think that uh, we're vulnerable. We cannot assume that democracy, and we've seen that on, on January 6th, right? We cannot assume that things are gonna be okay. So we really have to indeed be thoughtful of how do we, how do we change the game? This is a very, very important fight. So let's absolutely do coffee, <laughs> virtually or <laughs> physically, absolutely. We'll do coffee and, and, um, and we'll look forward to your next book, which, which talks about this. We have just a very few minutes left. So I'm going to ask you a question that several people have asked in different forms, which is, and several people have said, I work for Best Buy. Um, and again, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, Mr. Jolly was the real thing. It was amazing. <laughs> um, that was an incredible experience. Goes, goes to my heart. Oh my God. <laughs> um, how do we support other companies in embracing this kind of orientation? What, what needs to happen for the kind of way you manage Best Buy to become the mainstream way we run firms in this organization, in, in this country and in the world? I mean, yeah. how do we get every firm on this wavelength? Yeah, so I think there's, there's many things. First, uh, uh, here's the uh, you know, news. I'm not the only one who's leading like this. <laughs> I have many friends. You know, uh, I'm still a member of the Business Council, which is the top 200 uh, CEOs in the country. There's so many great examples of, uh, of great leaders. I sit on the board of Johnson & Johnson, Alex Gorski, you know, in, in that company, they, they, they say, uh, you know, they've been pursuing their credo since 1943. So, the, uh, many great examples. All of us are on this journey of how do we do this? So what can be helpful? Uh, I think that uh, having boards encourage uh, CEOs to be bold in this area. So as, from a board, you can play a big role. And I remember that after we had signed the BRT statement on corporate purpose and, and stakeholder capitalism, I, I was chair of the board still, I organized a debate within our board on, are we clear that this is the way you know, we want to uh, move forward. So boards have a role to play. Highlighting successes, because the pre here's an issue. In, 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 whether it's in this country or around the world, the time when you hear about companies is mostly around quarterly earnings, right? Because that's where the news flow is, right? We report on a quarterly basis. So this is when CNBC and the Journal and the Star Tribune here locally talk about the, the earnings and they talk mainly about financial results. We all know that this is not the majority of what happened at companies. So part of the idea of writing the book is to highlight stories about what great looks like. So the more purposeful leaders can highlight these stories, I think the more the, the better this is. I think our work, your work, my work at in business education on evolving business education and highlighting this. Um, I think the the ISS and Glass Lewis, uh, I, 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 know, I believe they are working on, they should be working on how they assess companies because they have a big role to play in, in uh, how uh, you know, resolutions get passed at uh, shareholder meetings. 
and then of course there's the role that employees and customers play i think that part of the beautiful thing that's happening is that employees are voting with their feet so employees i know my children right they, i have a number of i have four children and you know they, they decide where they want to work customers decide with what kind of firms so there's all sorts of pressure points or or encouragements to to move in that uh, direction the question is not about the direction it's about the pace and our ability so everything we can do to provide more tools uh, and examples again which is why the, the, uh, i've written this book uh, anytime we can find ways to accelerate so one of the things that's happening in the twin cities the 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 leaders in charge of diversity and inclusion in all of the local companies, and we have a bunch of, we have close to 20, 1400 companies here, they get together and they share practices. And they get together to see how can we accelerate change. So I think that's the direction. Um, anything to support and encourage, that's that's where I would, I would go. So thank you. Um, I would add to your list, and, and you yes, said, I was going to ask you, what would you say? As 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 employees, um, I, I think employees make a huge difference. Yeah, I've talked to so many CEOs who said they got interested in this because the employees insisted. Sure. They start thinking about these mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. I think as customers, we can play some role, but again, as citizens, yeah. I think firms will change when they're forced to change, and that so having, for example, strong and well-designed environmental regulation will really yep. help firms perform better. And yep. I think better labor legislation could make a big difference too. So I, I think we have to think about the whole system here. Exactly. But, uh, but yep. really, really appreciate. So thank you very much, Hubert. Yep. I'm going to invite Professor Jacobs back to join us. Larry, you uh, close us out. I wanna thank uh, both Hubert Jolie, author of the forthcoming The Heart of Business, former CEO of Best Buy and now a senior lecturer at the Harvard Business School, and Rebecca Henderson, who is a professor at the Harvard Business School. Very candidly, this was an extraordinary conversation. Um, my breath has been taken away by the, the breadth of it. I mean, from the innards of American corporate life and a leading CEO to the big issues of our day, including the uh, the the very deep and um, uh, um, racial challenges we have in front of us and the political challenges, as Hubert said, our, our sick political system. It's, it's really been um, a tremendous conversation. My recommendation is do this again and again and again. You two are ready for the road. <laughs>